Our guest today is a psychologist who was moved to work in suicide prevention after her younger brother, a Denver entrepreneur, died of suicide. She founded the Carson J. Spencer Foundation in his honor, and she speaks and advocates for mental health and suicide prevention all over the country. She serves in leadership as part of several suicide prevention task forces, including one at the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention in Washington, D.C. She's also an original founder of the website, which I think is incredible, Mm mantherapy.org. Proud Nation, please welcome to the show Sally Spencer Thomas. Hi, Sally. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It's a true privilege. Well, it's great to have you. And, you know, this is something that... I, we are just completely all aware of business ownership comes with, it's like business owners who decide to be entrepreneurs and own their own business. It's like they get in line for a second helping of overwhelming challenges. Sometimes ownership of businesses, uh, owning a business can feel like mountains of pressure on your shoulders. And, and I know that this is something that you understand from a personal level. So talk a little bit about how this subject became a focus of yours. Yeah, thank you. So um, I was a clinical psychologist, had all the you know alphabet soup after my name from going to school and I knew so much and all of this stuff. And then, and then it hits your family, right? And all of a sudden it becomes really real. My younger brother had been uh, a very successful entrepreneur here in Denver. He had launched a a national insurance company uh, in his mid-20s. And um, and with that came all of these pressures. Um, And he he had had shown some uh, some symptoms of mental health problems in his teenage years uh, when he was asked to leave school after making some really bad decisions. And he got the diagnosis of bipolar condition. But he came back from that. This was the late 80s. Nobody was talking about this kind of stuff. And he came back from that appointment and said, I don't know what this is. I don't have it. And I'm fine. And in the rest of that year that he had off from school, he discovered his gifts of being an incredible influencer and salesperson. Um, And he just went on for the rest of his young adult life, um, just knocking it out of the park. And he had an incredible gift of charisma and vision and creativity and drive. Um, So he was super successful as an entrepreneur. And then at at some point in the summer of 2004, uh, that went off the rails. Um, We had not seen um, what we call mania where all of a sudden he's not sleeping at all, he's not he's not eating well, he's making a ton of really bad decisions that were just destroying his business and his family, and no one could get through. We were all super worried, and no one could get through to him. And then when his accountant sat him down in the fall of 2004 and said, you're broke, you're done, you can't get any more money, your business is belly up, you're done, um, he flipped into the worst depression we had ever seen and two weeks later, he died of suicide. So that's when it became really personal for me. And um, when we formed this 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 initiative, um, we had two goals in mind: to uh, to both do bold gap filling work that would prevent what happened to Carson from happening to other people, but we also wanted to honor his life as as a bold visionary entrepreneur. And so we really tried to do our work in in creative and compelling ways. And I think it's it's incredible the work that you're doing. I know the one of the issues that we have in in working with blue collar business owners, it's a very masculine, mostly masculine um, uh, field or or industry. And uh, although there there are certainly women business owners too, and I don't want to neglect them in this discussion, but but one of the things that I want to highlight here is that men we don't like asking for directions. And we sometimes have trouble asking for the help that we need. And, and sometimes that help is, is understanding what's going on in a mental and emotional uh, place with us that is causing us or pushing us to feel like we don't have options. And we can believe some stories about how bad things are and not really be able to see clearly what we can do to get out of that situation. And it sounds like that's a large part of what you are devoting your life to now is is that work of being able to help people know you're not alone and there are some answers. 
Absolutely. And and I just want to underscore that fact that this this value of strength is 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 a good one, right? We wouldn't we wouldn't have, you know, all of all the people who can push through the day-to-day challenges and and still solve problems and still be providers, you know, if we didn't have this sense of, you know, pride about being strong. Um, the problem comes when your brain takes a left-hand turn, whether that's from addiction or a mental health condition like depression or bipolar condition or trauma. And all of a sudden that that strength becomes this kind of um, desperate white knuckling uh, where where it becomes impossible you know in the mind of the person experiencing it, it becomes impossible to admit to to share to disclose with anybody that wow I, I'm I'm losing it right and so um, that tends to escalate and not get better and um, we find the healing happens when people connect with one another and share these vulnerabilities and that's super hard um, for for a subgroup of of our community that just really prides themselves on their strength so i don't want to underestimate that 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 moment of uh you know feeling like things are out of control but how hard it is to reach out that's a very significant moment um, and it is so courageous to step through that and to reach out to someone and say, you know what, I could use some help here. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to brag on your website and how, how you're approaching it, I think is brilliant. I mean, we all went on it here and, and went through some of the videos that you guys have out. And I was like, this is fantastic to show that, they're, that men are not alone. And you guys do it in such a almost comedic way. Disarming. Yeah. 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 And mm-hmm. it, to show that, hey, you know, it's just okay. And I think what what is important with the work that you're doing is you made something that most men don't want to talk about. Mm-hmm. You're making it available and okay to talk about. Almost fun to talk about it in some ways. Uh, and to be able to share and and have that community of men that can share those those same things. And again, I'm I'm like Carter. I don't want to dismiss the women. I I just feel that most women are a lot stronger in this way than men. The connected in the, community. The connected in, in, in community. They are stronger in there. They they are willing to be more vulnerable, and they're also willing to ask for help. Uh, more so and and I've just you know in my lifetime I've seen that uh, I think younger men seem to be more able to do that but but a lot of you know middle age and, and older guys um, really struggle in that so how you know what do you say to a spouse or a child that has um, a husband or father that they're really having issues reaching what what is something that you could do or even uh, a business owner that knows another business owner uh, that is struggling maybe somebody's opened up to them uh, what is the the best way for them to uh, offer or, or tell them where they can get some help well, let me go back and just kind of respond to the to the website, mantherapy.org, and give a shout out to my partners, um, the creatives, all of the character, the compelling interface on the website, the production is all to be credited to a full service advertising agency we work with called Cactus. Now, that's my first message on how to do this well, is partner with somebody who understands how to communicate to target audiences. They've done a brilliant job of creating an experience for people. Um, and then my other partner is the Office of Colorado's Office of Suicide Prevention, which provided more of the kind of public health thinking of it, like what kinds of questions do we need to be asking, how do we evaluate it, and so forth. So just know that this tool wasn't kind of popped out of nowhere. There was tons of research that went behind it on what we know works to help people change attitudes and behaviors. Um, Related to your next question, um, there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, And and I really just wanna encourage people not to be afraid to reach out when they noticed changes in mood, in sleeping, in agitation, um, in productivity. Uh, A lot of these things are driven by underlying mental health challenges. And, And when you come into a conversation with the foundation of compassion and you hold that 
um, it's unlikely to go awry, right? If people are coming at you attacking, you're going to get defensive. But when people come at you with love and a, and a genuine desire to be helpful, um, eventually that can that can create a connection. So you start off the conversation by going, "Hey, I've noticed." I've noticed some things that have changed and you can list out those changes in behavior um, that you've noticed and the more concrete you are about time and place and exactly what you saw. And then you say, and I'm really concerned. Um, I'm worried that there's something going on because a lot of times when these things happen, there's something in the background that's, that's being distracting or overwhelming. And I want to let you know that I'm here for you. Setting up the conversation like that um, is a really great way to start. Now, they might not open up to you in that moment, but they heard you. Um, and if you're coming across with, with all of that authenticity of care, um, they can feel that. So sometimes it takes a couple knocks on the door um, to get somebody to open up. But you can just say, hey, I'm going to check back in with you tomorrow. Maybe we can go for a walk, go have coffee, grab a beer. Um, what we've also noticed is that um, men tend not to like a lot of intensity sometimes in these kinds of conversations. So sometimes it helps us if, if, if you do something like we call shoulder to shoulder stuff. So why don't you come over here and, you know, help me uh, fix the car or whatever. And while we're doing that, you can just interject gently some, some questions about how someone's doing. Um, I've also known a ton of people who've simply sent the, web, the website link, mantherapy.org, to someone they're worried about and say, hey, uh, I just checked this thing out. I didn't even know something like this has existed. I found it really helpful. I'm wondering what you think, right? Totally non-threatening way to start the conversation. Um, so these are just some kind of gentle prodding, gentle things that we can do to open up a conversation. That's really good. That's right. I, and and you're right. Um, sometimes approaching it head on is is a way to get a scared rabbit to run back in its hole. And, <laughs> right. and uh, but that side by side kind of thing, I, you know, one of the things that I saw on the website was a, I believe it was a cigar dinner or like a, just kind of a, a get together for men to just kind of hang oh, out. Oh yeah. 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 Oh gosh. Those have been so much fun. We call them guys night out <laughs> and we've, we've had a few. And then we also have done a couple of golf tournaments and it, it, it's very light. So the whole the main thing we're trying to do is create a sense of solidarity. So it is, you know, taste the barbecue. We even have kind of bourbon tasting sometimes. Uh, check your golf swing. Check out these motorcycles we brought in here. Uh, there's the Denver Nugget cheerleaders if you're interested, uh, you know. And and the guys just kind of mingle through all these different stations. And, um, and we create these conversation stations where they can come and sit and hang out. And then we just have like a 20-minute program. Um, and we've been able to attract – two governors, the mayor, uh, professional sports players, um, guys that these men really want to see and hang out with. And it just gives the whole topic of mental health and resiliency this level of credibility. Um, and it's been really fantastic to see, you know, hundreds of guys come to these things and say, you know what, this matters. It's part of my overall health. And here's the killer. Uh, I need to look out for my buddies. Um, I need to look out for my coworkers and my friends and my male family members because I know how hard this is. Um, and once they got that sense of community around this, uh, it's much easier to introduce these kinds of resources. Yeah, yeah. When you own a business and you've got employees, the pressure of feeling, you know, knowing that there's so many lives that depend on you getting it right, on you being able to do what you need to do. And you're back in the business office with the door closed and you're facing the realities of a business and, and perhaps a bad year. Uh, you know, that you, that is one of the most it's like a hole. It's like you're feeling so isolated. And a lot of times it's not that I need to have this really emotional um, outpouring to someone else in order to feel better. I just need to, like, know that that. I'm, I'm not alone. Just that knowledge that I'm not alone can yep. provide so much strength to me. It's like plugging in my dying cell phone into, yeah, uh, exactly. you know, that, that <laughs> I've been looking all over for the plug in the airport and I can't find it. And if I don't, you know, get my phone charged, I'm just going to die. And I've got calls to make and, ah, and then you find it, right. And you plug <laughs> yeah. in and it's like, ah, okay. You know, I've got energy. I've got, I've, I'm, I'm, I've got what I need. And, and that's just such a, it doesn't have to be emotional. It can just simply feel I'm connected to something. Yep. And so other people. 
Let me make a comment about um, the employer piece, because that's obviously really critical to your listeners. I mean, I speak a lot uh, across the nation about men's mental health, but I also speak a lot to industry. And one of the industries I spend a lot of time in is construction. Um, because they have the second highest rates for suicide uh, of all industry and the first highest numbers. And if we can correct this one industry, our national um, numbers of suicide will drop by over 4,000 people a year. So it's massive. It's absolutely massive. So every every time I get off the plane and I go into this, you know, this audience of 400, you know, mostly middle-aged white construction guys, I'm like, you're my guys, um, because they, so many of them have so much, um, so much risk factors for suicide. And what I tell the employers is, um, you have to model, you have to model this conversation and you have to model your own mental health to be trustworthy for the other people around you. Um, I have a, I work with a, a contractor here in Denver called RK, and the COO, it's about a thousand person um, mechanical contracting group. And um, he came to me, we were part of a leadership group together. And he said, Sally, when you talk about who's at risk for suicide, you're talking about my guys. And I said, I know. And he said, well, I don't want to wait till someone dies. Tell me what to do. And I said, you and your brother, his brother's the CEO. I said, you have to come out in front of your whole community and say, Suicide prevention and mental health promotion matter to us. This is going to be our top wellness priority and safety priority of the year. We're going to do training. We're going to have, you know, newsletter articles. You're going to hear this quite a bit. And why? Because it's a health and safety issue that matters for construction. And it matters to us personally. And this is how we're taking care of each other and ourselves. Um, And if you come to me as your employer and you say, I'm struggling, I've got your back. That was so important, and that's been important in a number of different places that we've been doing this work. I've got your back, and I'm going to persist with you until we figure this out together. We're going to find something that's going to help you. If you don't come to me and your mental health problem, your addiction, or your suicidal thoughts um, result in a performance issue, which they often do, then you leave me no choice. I have to address the performance thing, and nobody wants to do that. So just come to me when you're struggling, and I will help you. Awesome. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that that is awesome. And and I mean, I know at least one of our clients have actually had uh, um, not only was it a an employee, but a personal friend uh, that committed suicide. And, and you know, it, it was devastating in their business. So, I mean, it just means so much to, to take that round. But a lot of the, the small business owners don't think about that. And I think another thing and I'm going to this is my question to you is do you see that that we really are going to have to take this message on a company by company basis because it seems like the national conversation is is not being spoken about i mean i just i don't see the the mental health conversation uh discussed like i have before it's like it has just disappeared um, I think it's showing up in some places, you know, it's, it's showing up a lot with kids. Um, I think the, uh, so it's a lot of schools are very involved all the way through college. Um, but you're right. The workplace, uh, many of, many of us <laughs> mental health professionals and well-meaning mental health advocacy groups have tried to break into industry conversations, but we're, we're seen as outsiders. So it's really important to get within the industry some champions who are not mental health providers to really say, this is so important and we must do better because everything depends on it. Our businesses, you know, productivity and and profitability depends on people being mentally sound, very alert, um, you know, and and just psychologically healthy. Um, So that's, I think, been a big challenge. Uh, I am seeing a tremendous amount of momentum right now in construction. I never knew, I didn't know anything about it, you know, a couple of years ago. And now about 60% of the time I'm flying to different professional associations, different regional summits. Um, and, uh, the construction financial management association, CFMA, the accountants of construction, um, were the ones who have spearheaded this. So, and it's really because they were, you know, they got fire in their belly 
to do something different. And many of these are smaller or smaller mom and pop kinds of organizations. They have a number that are larger, but it's a lot of, you know, it's where people can affiliate to get that kind of support. Um, and they have championed this as their major initiative. This is a massive professional association. And that's where we start to see you know, many more people leaning in when somebody internally has championed it, um, an unsuspecting, unusual suspect has become the spokesperson of someone that had, that has high credibility. Now it's much easier to get these conversations started. Well, that's great. Well, you know, for a business owner to, uh, you know, because you provide a lot of uh, uh, materials to help not only uh, prevent, but the postvention stuff as well. And, you know, to help a business owner have conversations with their employees about what, where do we go from here when someone has committed suicide that is important to us and means something to us on our team. And, and I think that's important as well. You know, those resources are available. And, and I just want to tell our listeners that having this conversation, not only from the prevention standpoint, but knowing, having a conversation with employees about the importance of mental health, I think, is crucial. But you've got to be you got to be woke. I mean, you got to you got to have enough uh, mm-hmm. awareness about um, the importance of seeking help before you get to a point where you no longer feel like you've got options. Because sometimes, man, when the lid shuts, it feels like you can't open it again. And so, preventing that, in other words, it starts long before you feel like um, you don't have options. And and get being aware, surrounding yourself with that support early. Is that is would that be good advice? Oh, absolutely. And let me just actually back up to something you said at the beginning of that, which is the the postvention piece. So postvention is a jargony word in our in my little world that just means how do you respond in the aftermath of a suicide? And tragically, still um, that is the main way we get into workplaces and in industries is that people have this tragedy. I mean, nobody thinks it's going to happen to them until it happens to them. And they're totally unprepared. They don't have words for it. They can't process it. Um, and in workplaces, what often happens is that people just, you know, shove it into a closet and slam the door. And nobody helps the coworkers with grieving. Nobody acknowledges this is really hard to process and deal with. We, everybody tries to make it go away, but it doesn't. It always stays. It lingers. It's, it's something too big to just smush away. Um, so dealing with that grief and the trauma and helping people process that and honor the life that was lived with dignity and being able to talk about the tragedy of suicide is so important, um, but we want to—we don't want that model to continue. That the only time people get woke, as you said, is that in the aftermath of tragedy, because then you know we're not in prevention mode. We want to prevent that. So one of the ways that we have found that is so 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 effective across all kinds of populations is what we call lived experience stories of hope and recovery. And you'll see on the mantherapy.org website, we have a whole library of all kinds of different men, different ages, different races and ethnicities, different you know backgrounds, different reasons for their suicidal despair. And each of them are telling a story of what it felt like in the downward spiral so you can connect with them. Um, and most importantly, how they got out. Um, everyone's got a different recovery path. Everyone's got a different thing that helped them. Um, and when we start to hear stories, especially from people that are very similar to us, someone we can really relate to, and maybe even like one step above us in the social stratification of power and respect, if we can see someone like that tell a story of coming through a very big emotional experience, a very big, um, overwhelming life challenge, uh, something where they were kind of like on the brink and they reached out and they had some kind of transformational experience from that reaching out. And now they're better for it. They've actually gained in their resiliency. They've gained in their, in their leadership, in their sense of a human. Um, those are the kinds of stories that change everything. Mm-hmm. So I'm always looking for people within a workplace or within an industry that can be that lived experience story of hope and recovery for me. Because once they're done, all the rest of the work is easy because everybody, everybody, first of all, everyone knows they're not alone. Um, There's somebody just like them that's gone through. They have a pathway of hope. I know if they made it, I can make it. And now they're much more able to listen to the resources, what, you know, what counseling might look like, how to, you know, how to get well. 
Yeah, that's, that's, that's the breakthrough. It's the, the shift in mindset from there are no answers, I have no choice, to this isn't what I thought it was, and I have nothing but upward, you know, uh, mobility in this. Or, you know, I can look upward and see uh, away from here to where I need to be. Right, right. That's important work. And Sally, I am so glad that you are doing that work. And I want to stay connected to you in that work because I think it is um, so important. And I want to thank you too for being on the show to talk a little bit about it. Is there anything else that you would say? And and I'm talking about the person who's listening to the show who is challenged with some feelings like I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know how to get out of this and I don't see any options left and, you know, is in that place. Could you talk to that person for a minute about what you see in their world? Yeah, I have a couple of things I want to say about that. So um, the main behavior that mantherapy.org wants people to engage in is going through that self-screening tool. So once you get to the website, you can self-screen for depression, anxiety, anger, and substance use. And then all of a sudden, all the resources that you might need kind of pop up on your screen in a very kind of compelling way that you want to check them out. So that's one thing that I recommend. A lot of people wonder, you know, they sit in their own little head and they wonder, how bad is it? You know, should I actually go seek help or, you know, do I do I have this? Can I control it myself? And things like screening tools can be a way that people move from this isolated thought process to starting to engage with resources. Um, so that's one thing I would recommend is go to the web, mantherapy.org website and just self-screen and see what how you come up. You know, if you've come up flagged in any of these areas, it's probably going to help you uh, to reach out and get involved with some of these resources. If if the person is really in the middle of kind of that life or death moment, we know that it's sometimes just a behavior away for death. And there are a few things that can help with that kind of crisis. Um, one, you can reach out to some very important anonymous and confidential crisis resources. And those are also on therapy.org. One is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, 1-800-273-8255. Um, another is the crisis text line, You go to crisistextline.org and you can learn how to use that. Um, These provide, uh, you know, in the moment, immediate support, not only for the person in crisis, but for all the people around them to kind of de-escalate the situation and come up with a a safety plan to get them over the hump of this white hot crisis um, and into the next moments so that, you know, we can start to put one foot in front of the other. And the third thing that I would say is critically important for the people in the throes of that white hot crisis is it's absolutely essential and life-saving during those times, during that white hot crisis, to remove from their home or from their access anything that they could use to kill themselves. Um, There's tons and tons of data that will show that when we get the pills out of the house, when we get the firearms out of the house, during that white hot crisis, we save people's lives because the, the, the time frame between the moment that they say, today's the day, and when they actually engage in the behavior is a matter of minutes and hours. So we want to make it hard for them to, to enact on those thoughts in that very brief time frame. Now, it doesn't mean these things have to be out of the house forever, um, but we know like 80% of kids who die of suicide die from a firearm in their own home. Um, you know, this is what, what people use. They use what's accessible to them. So when we've identified a person in crisis, if you are the person in crisis, um, you know, tell somebody can you can you hold my stuff until I until I get to the other side of this? Uh, if you're the loved one of somebody who's going through the crisis, you can have these collaborative conversations with you know other family members, or you can even bring things to you know other drop off locations. Sometimes police departments take them. Um, it's just super important to get that stuff out of the house. Boy, that's that's wise advice. Um. I want to stay connected with you, Sally, because I think this is an ongoing conversation that's just important to have. And, um, and, and so we'll, we'll do that. But for now, I want, I want people to know how they can connect with you, 
uh, either to have you speak in their organization or uh, just to connect with you about resources. And, and of course, we're going to link to mantherapy.org on this uh, podcast and in the show notes as well. But, but how can they connect with you? Thank you so much. Yeah, I do. I do, do keynotes at conferences. I do um, consultation on how to build strategy. I do more in-depth workshops and trainings around skill development. I, and I'm very, very familiar with, with you know, tough and rough audiences. In fact, it, it warms my heart every time I'm in front of them. Um, you, people can learn about the different things that I can do. And I have tons of resources at sallyspencerthomas.com. That's S-A-L-L-Y-S-P-E-N-C-E-R-T-H-O-M-A-S.com. Very good. I'm also, I'm also on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, all those places. If they want to have conversations with me, I'm happy to do that. Awesome. And we always like to end our, our guest interview by asking our guests for a quote that has meant something to them in their own journey. Maybe you could share a quote with us and then tell us a little bit about what it means to you. Yeah, this is a quote from Robert Ingersoll, who was a, a poet, and it meant a lot to me um, coming through the, the throes of my brother's death, and I really think it speaks a lot to both the grief process and also to the process of just coming through our darkest days. It's, in the night of death, hope sees a star, and listening love can hear the rustle of a wing. And I think it's just, you know, I, 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 it's kind of cliche, but it's true. Hope is the antidote to suicide. And if we can create hope for people in their darkest moments, whether that's through our connections with them, our friendships, um, you know, you matter to me kinds of conversations. And if we can help them connect to a purpose in their life, something bigger than themselves, um, that's usually how people find their way through. Oh, that's great. Sally Spencer Thomas, thank you for being on our show today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for letting me speak to your folks. Uh, these are the folks that I want to be speaking to. Take care.